Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Today's special guests are experts in the mind, like experts about the mind, I guess is a better way to say it. The psychology of the human primate, especially when it comes to our deeply held beliefs. I've always been a bit intimidated by the study of psychology, but Thanks to the Great Courses Plus, I have been able to participate. I've been learning about the history and the practice of psychology at my own speed, right? Dr. Katherine Sanderson, she dives deep into the generation and perception of ideas, brain chemistry and its effects, nature, nurture, cognitive errors, the reasons that we misperceive the world around us, the terrifying malleability of memory, And, of course, the wonderful workings of our natural brains. You can see the whole course with your free trial and get 20% off your annual membership at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. And if you've got other interests, they have lectures on learning music and the cosmos and financial planning, learning a language, so much more. Streaming 24-7 anywhere, including via the Great Courses Plus app. Video, audio, audio books. Do not miss out on this great deal. Go now to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth to get your free trial. And my listeners will also get 20% off the annual membership. Again, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. Let me just start by encouraging you to take this journey with me. And it may require that you listen when you're not quite as distracted as you might otherwise be. Because we're going to take a deeper dive into belief in the brain with a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And I think we're going to take a fair and uh, kind of in-depth look at belief, how a religious belief happens, evolves, survives, thrives. And a lot of these concepts, you know, I don't think you brush by them. I think you need to take a little time, think about it, digest it, talk about it. You know, just run these ideas through the processor of your brain. So, you know, if you're doing 15 other things, come back to this show. You know, come back when you can take the time to really give it the attention it deserves. And thank you so much to my special guest today. I've got Dr. John Wathing. He is a computational biologist. He has a doctorate in the neurosciences, and he's author of a book called The Illusion of God's Presence, The Biological Origins of Spiritual Longing. I've also got Dr. Andy Thompson. He's been on the show a few times. A psychiatrist, he's published works on everything from narcissistic personality disorder to racism to depression, PTSD, and more. Lots of analysis on religion and the brain. And his book, we've talked about it quite a bit on the show, Why We Believe in Gods, A Concise Guide to the Science of Faith. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. John, or I know you go by Jack, Dr. Wathi, whichever you prefer. What is a computational biologist? What's that even mean? Well, it varies from one person to another. For me, it's um, using computers to solve interesting puzzles in biology. And that can be all over the map. A lot of people who call themselves computational biologists are interested in molecular biology and the problem of, you know, we have a vast library now of genetic sequences from doing the Human Genome Project and the genomes of many species. So there's a huge problem of of aligning genetic sequences. But there's also the problem of trying to understand how the brain works, which is another enormously complicated, information-rich field of biology where we, we know of tens of billions of neurons in 
various parts of the brain that connect to one another in extremely complex ways, and we try to understand how this works. And one way to try to get a handle on it is to simulate, you come up with some idea of, of how neurons work or how connections of neurons work, and you simulate that in a computer and run the simulations and see how well or poorly that matches reality. So that's kind of what I've, I've done. I've, I spent a lot of my years doing simulations of how proteins fold. By the way, this is just how my brain works. I think folding protein sounds like an 80s band, but that's just how my, my mind works. <laughs> Dr. Thompson, I want to start with you with something that landed on my radar. This story, and you can tell me if it's true, you were once back in the day convinced that the JFK assassination was a huge conspiracy, and I was kind of the same, right? I was a lot like the old yeah. Oliver Stone movie. No way. Mm -hmm. Oswald was a lone shooter. It was the CIA or black ops, or it was a coup d'etat to try to enable the Vietnam War for the war profiteers, right? And I was that guy for a long time. Was this you back then? Uh, similar, yeah. I had a hard time believing it was a pathetic loner that took JFK out. I was, um, I think, early high school and lived just outside of Washington, D.C. I'd been to JFK's inauguration. I was a Boy Scout usher. I admired the president, admired the presidency, and like a lot of people, just found it hard to believe that something other than a tragic loner murdered him. Now, how did that change? Again, you know, good, solid facts. The book, Case Closed. Posner, I believe, I can't think of his first name, was the author, and a Wall Street Journal reporter who likewise thought it was a conspiracy, and he investigated, did a marvelous book, and just laid out all the facts, one tremendous uh, argument, so to speak, and that sort of solved it. And I, by that point, I was already a psychiatrist, and I was interested in Oswald's psychology and psychiatry at that point. And I thought Posner had done a, a very good job, but he had evidence that I think he could have taken just a little bit further. And so with his book and some others, I wrote a little paper on Oswald's personality. There's an interesting story along those lines. Because one of the things that set us all up for conspiracies was the Warren Commission was actually very good. And the Warren Commission, uh, the people that did the legwork were U.S. attorneys, and they did a fantastic job. And when they came down to writing their final report, they laid out all the evidence. But Governor Connolly would never accept that there wasn't a separate bullet designed for him. He sort of had to have his own bullet. And he brought political pressure to bear on, I think it was... Richard Russell or somebody else. But if you go to the Warren Commission report, the final paragraphs suddenly turned to mush and left the door open for conspiracy theories. But the Warren Commission had basically solved it. But Connolly intervened and brought pressure on the commission to muddle the conclusions. Now we're drifting into where I'm going with all this, right? Belief in yeah. the brain, belief versus when you are presented with the data. I have heard it said... Mm -hmm that fundamentalist religions are themselves conspiracy theories. I'll start with you, Dr. Wathi. What's your take on that? Are fundy religions conspiracy theories by design? That's a great question. Um, you know, I've never quite explored that question in my mind before, but I've just noticed, as I'm sure you have, that the two certainly go together. I know lots of fundamentalist Christians through various connections, Facebook being the main one. And the two are just tightly coupled, extremely tightly coupled. Certainly there's a connection between magical thinking and uh, fundamentalist religion. I'm interested in, you know, it's a great story. It's good versus evil. And all this that is happening in the headlines is a precursor to... Armageddon, really, if you're a devout Christian. And, you know, Satan is under every rock, and one day this is going to happen and that's going to happen. There's an ulterior motive. Everything is part of a battle between the light and the dark. And so, you know, I think there may be something to that. Dr. Andy Thompson, you want to weigh in? That is a very astute observation on your part, Seth. Well, that's just a thought that I had heard out there and, and borrowed. Why create mediocrity when you can copy genius? You know, I heard that elsewhere, and I just relayed it here on the show. But uh, Whoever's observation is, I think that's a very good one, because, uh, yeah, I, I think they're correct in that it hijacks vulnerabilities that we all have. And we can easily share beliefs, 
in, you know, we have these hyperactive agency detection mechanisms. So if, if something happens, then there has to be a powerful human-like force creating it, and, you know, it can quickly spread. And we're, I think all of us are vulnerable to, you know, again, overread agency, overread group agency. I think there's all sorts of things that make us vulnerable to generate and believe and share conspiracy-like theories. You know, I've encountered people I would consider otherwise hugely intelligent people who have bought into some wild conspiracies. You know, a lot of these apocalyptic conspiracies, they are connecting dots that uh, I don't think were supposed to be connected, right? Is there any truth to the idea that smart people outsmart themselves? You know, we often align religions with IQ or lack of, and this is sort of a lazy way that many atheist activists have approached religious people. Do either of you want to speak to intelligence and the brain? Let me tackle that one first. I think you're definitely onto something there. One of the points I try to make in my book is that a lot of religion comes from intuitions, innate intuitions, things we're born with. And I emphasize two in particular. One are intuitions that tend to make us highly social animals. And another is a set of intuitions that have to do with attachment of human infants to their mothers. And these two different things give rise to two different kinds of religion. But the brain of an adult has a remarkable capacity for rationalization. When we have these intuitions that drive us through emotional means to believe something, if we think it through carefully and logically and using reason and evidence, we would find it doesn't work. (laughs) But rather than do that, what we tend to do is to rationalize. We'll come up with all sorts of elaborate stories in our minds that will make it easier for us to accept the things that we feel emotionally must be true. So, for example, that's what gives rise to very complex and elaborate theologies, strange and complex beliefs of of Catholicism that, you know, have all of these rules and motivations and things that are happening behind the scenes, like you say, that we're just very good at confabulating and rationalizing. That's That's the essence of what I'm trying to say. And I think for more intelligent people, more intelligent people are better at coming up with rationalizations that will convince themselves. Yeah, they outsmart themselves. I mean, I guess if I was to distill it down. Another thing is the human mind hates powerlessness and helplessness. And we'd rather come up with an explanation than to feel powerless or helpless. That's why you and I will joke and say, well, it rained today because I didn't bring my umbrella. Because we don't want to be helpless and powerless. It's very painful. We hate it. And we'll try to avoid it, even at the cost of crazy theories. One thing I I would like to add to that discussion about conspiracy theories is uh, your thought about, you know, demons and everything is evil and there's evil behind the scenes. That that sparked a very specific uh, recollection for me. One of my friends on Facebook, who is not a Christian at all anymore, she, or at least she, she had a deconversion from being a Jehovah's Witness. She was brought up in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And that is an extremely conspiratorial fundamentalist religion. They're always preaching about demons. Demons are present everywhere, all the time, trying to seduce you and confuse you and mislead you. So it's a very paranoid way of viewing the world. And um, she's had a great deal of personal struggle with it in her life. And I, I won't mention her name. I won't say too much specific about her story, except to say that Her story has become a famous one in a sense. She is one of the people who has been accused of being racist in attacking a black person for doing something completely normal. And I won't go into too much detail about it because I don't want to hurt anybody involved. But I'll just say that she was probably innocent of the charges of racism. She was guilty of doing what what she said she did to, you know, call the police on somebody who was doing something completely innocent. But the reason she did it, I think, based on what I know of her and her background, is that she is still, to this day, a very fearful person. And when she's in a situation where anything can be taken as a threat, she takes it as a threat because she grew up in this. So she has kind of a a conspiratorial mindset that's very hard for her to shake because she grew up with it as a child in this fundamentalist religion. Just to footnote something, I think John is being modest, that 
his book is extraordinary. And anybody interested in the psychological science of religious belief, supernatural belief, I would strongly encourage you because I think he's brought an Occam's razor to it and has distilled the essence of what goes into religious belief, the combination of social adaptations and attachment adaptations, and particularly the very early ones. It's just an extraordinary book, and uh, I would encourage anybody listening to the podcast, even if they don't think they're that interested in the psychological science of religious belief, to it's a feast. And I strongly encourage anyone who's even marginally interested to grab it and read it. I'll actually link Dr. Wathi's book, The Illusion of God's Presence, The Biological Origins of Spiritual Longing, and I'll uh, link to yours as well, Dr. Thompson, Why We Believe in God's A Concise Guide to the Science of Faith. I'll put those both in the description box. Let me stay with you, Dr. Thompson. I've heard it said, and I feel like in some ways this is a kind of bigotry of lowered expectations, and I may be totally wrong on this, but... There's a thinking out there, well, you know, some people out there just aren't able to cope with the real world, and they kind of need religion like a warm blanket to get them through. And, you know, we speak about them like we're patting them on the head. You poor, poor people, <laughs> you don't have the tools that the rest of us have to deal, and you kind of mm-hmm. need religion and good for you. And I've heard it called the bigotry of lowered expectations. But do you think mm-hmm. that there are some people who need religion? Maybe they're out there, but I I think it is a bigotry. I think we're being demeaning of our fellow human beings and that we're not extending to them the possibility that they can cope with the vicissitudes of life without religion. And I'm sure all of us have met working class people that have said, you know, just never made any sense to me. And they quietly are unbelievers in communities where belief is strong you know, in the Bible Belt or some of these places. And so I, I do think it is a kind of uh, a bigotry. And, and I think we ought to extend to them the same possibilities that we extend to ourselves and you know, to others. Dr. Wathi? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that, um, I think that anybody with, you know, just sort of average human intelligence is, is capable of, of seeing through religion, given the right training and encouragement and, and so forth. But I would add a caveat to that, which is that the deeper you get immersed into a religion, the longer you've been in it, the more sacrifices you've made for it, the more tightly coupled your social network is to religion, the more friends you have in it, the more important religion is to your spouse, for example, the harder it is to break away from it. Because you sort of know in the back of your mind even if you know in the back of, the, of your mind, even if you suspect, oh, this, this can't all be true, this religious, religion stuff doesn't really make as much sense to me as it once did, you also know in the back of your mind that you might get divorced if you come out as an atheist. You might lose your social network. You might lose your, your friends that you see at Wednesday night prayer meeting and Sunday service and so on. The more deeply immersed in it you are, the harder it is to break free of it. I think we're talking about the sunk cost fallacy or being yes. pot committed, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's a, a line I saw once. It said, don't be afraid to walk away from a mistake just because you took a long time making it. And I always thought that was a pretty good line. Yeah. But it's easier said than done. And, and I think Jack points out something that's another kind of bigotry, which is that I think you have to distinguish people who have left psychologically and who are no longer believers and left psychologically, but who cannot leave socially. And I think we at times in the atheist community are, you know, a little bit intolerant of them and say, well, you should be able to walk away. And I think we want to step back from that. I have one close friend who's a minister, and he did a lot of pastoral counseling, and he more or less just moved into doing, uh, he's basically a mental health professional. But his non-belief is very quiet because he's in a a deeply religious community. His wife is deeply religious. In fact, her livelihood is connected to it. And it'd be unfair to expect him to publicly move away from it. And I think there, you know, people would say, well, he should be able to sort of stand up for it and walk away. And say, no, that's unfair to him. I think that's kind of a binary approach to, you know, if 
Mm-hmm. You don't shout it from the mountaintop that you don't buy it anymore, that you're some kind yeah. of uh, sellout or coward. And we don't often address or address often enough, perhaps, that you're not just asking someone to walk away from a superstitious belief. Yeah. There is, I think, a system of, uh, you know, I call it emotional blackmail, cultural blackmail, even financial blackmail, if your employer is a believer, familial yeah consequences, cultural consequences, where if you don't toe the line, you are cast off. I see a lot of students at University of Virginia, and I'm about an hour north of Jerry Falwell's empire in Lynchburg. And I have seen over the years young adults whose families have basically disowned them and ostracized them and cast them away because they revealed their non-belief. And it's heartbreaking. And these are, you know, they're lovely young adults that you would want as a child. And the families have absolutely banished them. And it's crushing to them uh, because they love their families and their communities. And it's heartbreaking. It's a very real phenomenon. I was talking to uh, David Fitzgerald. He's author of several counter-apologetics books. And he once told me that if you need proof of evolution, look at Christianity right? How Christianity has had to evolve defense mechanisms or had to evolve its own narrative to stay relevant in the culture. So either of you want to weigh in on that? Dr. Wathi, I guess I'll start with you. I mean... Oh, yeah, definitely. That's a very astute observation. I think religions definitely do evolve. It's 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 an evolution in In the cultural space, it's cultural evolution, of course, but it's the analogy to biological evolution is direct. You have selective pressures and you have mutations and you have adaptations and you have competition and survival and extinction. Think, for example, about, and in in my book, I try to make this case and, and I use two examples, one being Mormonism and the other Shaferism, which are sort of new cultish religions that arose at about the same time, early 19th century, and got similar starts in similar places, but one of them has taken off and is flourishing and is now considered sort of a major religion, and the other is virtually extinct. The last time I checked, there were only three practicing shakers in existence. Now, let me make sure I'm hearing the word. Is it shaker as in shaking something or... Yes. The actual name of the religion is the United, I think it's something like um, the United Society of Believers in the Second Coming, something like that. Wow. But they go by shakers most often, and it's because they got the name because they were known for ecstatic religious rituals in which they would dance and ro- go around in circles and do all kinds of physical gyrations. So it was a very elaborate and emotional cult, and it was very much a cult. It was originally founded by a woman named Anne Lee, in, um, who emigrated from England in the late 18th century. But the big difference between these two, and this is the whole point, is that Mormons emphasize having large families in their religion. So, you know, being married and having a lot of kids is a big deal in Mormonism. Whereas in Shakerism, <laughs> the big deal, the big theological thing is abstinence. Sex is evil. And if you want to live a pure, good Christian life, then you must abstain from sex. And when a family joins the Shakers, the children get separated from the parents. The men and women live in separate buildings. (laughs) They go to services together, but they don't touch. They stand on opposite sides of the room. And, you know, all of these things that are guaranteed to assure reproductive failure. (laughs) They could only grow during the 19th century through conversion through getting new members, but, but not through reproduction. And, and of course, as we know, the, the easiest path to religious belief is to be indoctrinated from childhood. So the Shakers lost that path, and their religion is now nearly extinct, but the Mor- Mormons are flourishing. So that's a long way of saying, yes, religions do evolve and adapt themselves both to human nature and to the culture they're, they're thriving in. Well, I even think about examples in the animal kingdom, the defense mechanisms against a threat. And you look at things like blasphemy laws. This is a defense mechanism that religions have evolved or at least implemented, adapted to try to survive and insulate themselves from threats. 
Oh, absolutely. And, and of course, the most effective implementation of it is when the blasphemy laws carry the death penalty, as they do in some parts of the world. Talking here with my special guest, psychiatrist and author Dr. Andy Thompson, and computational biologist and neuroscientist Dr. John Wathy. And I'll pose my next question to you, sir. You have said that you're dissatisfied with a lot of skeptics, their approaches to religion. I think we have evolved a little bit on this issue. You know, there it used to be just snark. I mean, I was guilty of this. I came out of religion. I was pissed off, and I was, you know, I was going after Santa Claus for adults, right, which I thought was the Christian Jesus. And, you know, I made no headway. I, I, was, yeah. I was only frustrated because the data wasn't changing minds. I had an absence of empathy because I think I was all worked up. You know, I'd been lied to for 30 years, damn it. You know, I had all those things going on in my mind. And, uh, you know, I made some really bad arguments and had some really bad tactics. And I get the vibe that you think that much of the skeptical community were fighting and even dying on the wrong hill. Did I read that right? Yeah, I think that's fair. One of the main things that I objected to with the initial wave of new atheism books was, first of all, I loved them. I, I, I want to make that clear. I, I'm an atheist, too, and I've gone through the same phase as you just described. We all have our bones to pick with religion, and I had mine. So I, I loved The God Delusion and Hitchens' God is Not Great and Sam Harris's book and all of that. They were great. But I felt they were missing something really important. They tended to criticize the most egregious fundamentalist meanness of religion, the hostility of religion, the, the violence of religion. They, they came, obviously, right after the 9-11 attacks, which is so it, it kind of makes sense that they would emphasize things like religious violence and hatred and bigotry. But in doing so, I felt they were overlooking half, at least, of what religion is all about, and that is the longing for a connection to a, a loving Savior, for someone who will save you from desperate helplessness or misery, which is a big part of what is the personal religious experience. So that's what I try to emphasize in my book. You just made the segue that uh, I was sort of leaning toward. So actually, you should be hosting. Dr. White, because <laughs> that's really so. good. Uh, but I was going to ask Dr. Thompson about, um, you know, the yearning for a higher power, a master plan agency. You know, you're a mental health professional. Are human beings, we're, are we born to look up to the horizon, to the heavens, and you know, seek God? Yes and no. I'm still both in that you don't want to be around me probably after I've binged watched a lot of Christopher Hitchens uh, <laughs> videos. Um, I just, uh, it, you know, I love his work, Sam Harris, uh, Richard Dawkins. And I think there is still a place for a healthy contempt, particularly when religion is doing some of the damage that it does. At the same time, I think we have to step back and come at it from a scientific point of view. And we are, and I think few people realize it. We're at an extraordinary place right now. We're, we're the first generation in the history of our species, in the history of the world, which is closing in on a comprehensive psychological science, cognitive neuroscience of religious belief. I mean, we really are starting to understand how and why the brain generates religious beliefs, why the specific ones they generate, why we're all vulnerable to latching on to them. We're really at a completely different place than we were 30 years ago. And I think that's one of the strengths of John's work is that he, more than anybody else I've seen, and I think more than anybody else that's out there, has honed in on the complicated early pieces of our attachment mechanisms, the early neonatal infantile attachment mechanisms that make us vulnerable to the longing for rescue from intense distress that is at the, the basis of so much religious belief. There are people like Lee Kirkpatrick who had mapped out a lot of how the attachment system is involved, but John has taken it to a whole deeper uh, level, and it's just beautiful, and it's, it's all supported with fascinating examples from biology, but then really some of the most interesting are, are taking what scientists in child development have done 
and showing even neonates have an innate model of a mother and certain mechanisms to identify her and move towards her and that those mechanisms are still present in our brains and make us uh, one of the things that makes us particularly vulnerable to religious belief at times of distress. All right, you teed up Dr. Wathi. I'm not going to read the book, obviously. I want everybody to read the book for themselves. But, yeah. you know, give me the Cliffs Notes here. We as babies and our approach to our caregivers speaks to our quest for gods. Am I hearing that correctly? I mean, take that wherever you want to. Sure. Um, well, I'm glad Andy mentioned Lee Kirkpatrick and his attachment theory of religion. I often say, when I'm talking about my book, I often say that this, what I call the neonatal root of religion, is something that science has mostly overlooked. And I throw in the word mm -hmm. mostly, mainly because of Lee Kirkpatrick. He's a psychologist in Virginia who's devoted the last, I don't know, several decades of his career to doing this, to, to emphasizing this infantile aspect of religiousness and relating it to John Bowlby's attachment theory of, of uh, infantile and childhood development. It's great, great work, but there were... There are a few things in it that don't quite make sense without some of the pieces that I've tried to add in, in my book. And the main, main thing I've tried to add in my book is that um, – let me back up for just a minute and, and give an analogy. When a, an infant is learning language, human infants start learning language almost immediately. The human brain, even before birth, even prenatally, is capable of perceiving – speech phonemes with remarkable fidelity and responding specifically to human speech phonemes. So the speech cortex is innately wired to be speech receptive or speech expectant. Our speech cortex is expecting to hear human language before we're even born. And what I'm trying to suggest in my book is that the cortex that's specialized for human social behavior as adults has something like that. It's, it's, it's expecting other humans to exist, and especially it's expecting one very important other human to exist, that being, of course, the infant's mother, because human infants are born completely helpless and absolutely dependent on maternal care. Now, other adult attachment figures are important too, but the mother is the most important because she provides nourishment through breastfeeding. So human infants are born with an innate expectation of the existence of this being that will save them from certain death without her care. So in the book, I try to show how there's a, a lot of evidence from sociobiology, from primatology, from studies of infant behavior that back up this idea. And because it's something that is innate and basically hardwired, it's there throughout adult life, but sort of dormant. It, it, it's there, but doesn't do very much most of the time for most people. But for people who get into a really desperate situation, a dark night of the soul, a time when they're you know, maybe at the depths of drug addiction or some other terrible loss or tragedy and feel absolutely helpless. Those circumstances are so much like the conditions of infancy, early infancy, that it may trigger this circuitry and conjure this image of the existence of some other being out there somewhere who wants to save you, who will save you, who's capable of saving you from this desperate situation. And by the time people as an adult are having experiences like this, they will have been enculturated in religion, even if they were not indoctrinated with it themselves. They will have heard it and know about it. And it's very, very easy under those conditions to feel that must be God. I'm sensing the presence of God. And this is obviously my salvation. And it's so easy to just slip right into religious belief at that point. Well, Dr. Wathi, tell me if this is then a clumsy connection. But we look at Christian language, because that's my former religion. I'll camp out there. But, you know, I am helpless without God, like the infant. We are fed the message of God or the Word. God is our protector. He gives us shelter. We are his children. You know, we live in, and worship yes. in houses of God. This is a familial model model where we are the infants, right? Oh, yeah. If you think about this idea and start looking 
with this in, in the back of your mind, you will see infantile imagery throughout religion. One of the most obvious examples in Christianity is the, the idea that you must be born again to become a Christian, to be saved. You must become an infant again to accept Jesus into your life. I devote a whole chapter to just this thing, infantile imagery and religion. And it's although for us in our culture, Christianity is the most familiar example, you can see it in many, many others. One analogy I like to draw is between baby Jesus in Christianity and baby Krishna in Hinduism. In both cases, you have a strange kind of infantile imagery where God the Savior is turned into an infant. Well, why would we do that? Why is that an important thing to do? And I think part of the reason is that although in this infantile kind of religiousness I'm talking about, God is normally seen as the saving parent and, and the infant is you, the, the helpless person needing salvation. There is that other side of religion we were just talking about a few minutes ago, the, the hateful, aggressive, violent authoritarian, social kind of religion that the new atheists were railing on about. That's also there, and God in that formulation is cruel and judgmental and punishing. And that sets up a terrible conflict in the minds of people who, you know, have this longing for a, an unconditionally loving Savior. And the easiest way to defang this God of the social root, as I call him, the, the judgmental, cruel, and punishing God the easiest way to defang him is to turn him into an infant, a helpless infant baby himself. And so we tend to do that in religions, and one manifestation of that is baby Jesus. And another one that happened, evolved completely independently in a completely different religion thousands of miles away and thousands of years ago is, is helpless baby Krishna, which is just as big a deal for Hindus as baby Jesus is for Christians. Well, that's interesting. So... If I'm understanding our celebration of the nativity Jesus, the swaddled baby in the manger, might be a projection of our own infantile model for the allegiance to the Heavenly Father. Yes, that's right. Wow. But it's just a role reversal. One tangent to go back to just for a second here, but the person who's distressed and becomes religious you see that in Francis Collins, the director of NIH. And if you look at his autobiography, and here's a guy who's an MD, PhD, was an atheist, but he was brought up in the Bible Belt in a fundamentalist area. And he had that crisis by the waterfall and becomes a believer. So you absolutely see this dynamic in a very brilliant, accomplished scientist. Talking here with computational biologist Dr. John Wathy and psychiatrist Dr. Andy Thompson, both authors. Let's talk about the utility of religion connecting people. And I think it was you, Dr. Thompson, you were speaking about how religion back in you know our early days on the African savanna, but religion had utility in creating tribal bonds among people who were not family. So if we were safer and more productive as communities, but we weren't bio-family, religions provided another family model. Yeah, I think what you see, if you look at the earliest religions, and I think uh, Nicholas Wade's book, The Faith Instinct, he maps it out beautifully. We're very dependent on song, dance, and these rituals that would generate intense activity of neurotransmitters involved in bonding. And I think in our earliest religions and our earliest communities, it was probably highly you know, there were a lot of kin there. But when we started to move to larger communities where there's less people who are actual kin, you create pseudo kin and you create kin like bonds and you do that through religion, but particularly religious ritual. The word religion comes from religare, which is to bind. Religion means to bind together, binding kin and non kin and making non kin pseudo kin. I'll let either one of you weigh in on this, but you had done an experiment, Dr. Thompson, where people got together and sang a hymn. And this caused mm -hmm. a pleasure response or a bonding response, perhaps is a better way of saying it, in the brain. Like it changed brain chemistry, communal music? Yeah. If you look at religious rituals and even secular rituals, what they do in common is they boost neurotransmitters which are involved in bonding. So 
dancing and particularly symmetrical movement boosts endorphins and oxytocin, but particularly endorphins. We think of endorphins as pain relievers. They're bonding. It has powerful bonding effects. When you and I make music, we generate endorphins. So if we are dancing or swaying and particularly swaying symmetrically, we're generating huge amounts of endorphins. If we're singing, we're generating huge amounts of endorphins. If we're touching, we're generating endorphins and oxytocin, huge binding. And then you're also boosting serotonin, which increases self-esteem, gets you focused outwards away from inward focus. You are boosting norepinephrine. You're boosting dopamine, which is pleasure. But dopamine and norepinephrine are also things that mark uh, salience. They make things memorable. And so when I used to give talks frequently on my book, I would have the audience think about how they were feeling, think about how they felt about someone they loved but were in conflict with. And I would have them pinch themselves as hard as they could to create a level of pain. And then we would link arms, start swaying and sing. Sometimes have people sing Amazing Grace, which they may really not like the lyrics, but they belt out Amazing Grace. And then we would just do it for two minutes and then stop. And I'd, you know, ask them to see where their pain threshold was, how they felt about themselves and how they felt about the person that they were in conflict with. And it was always interesting. And you could just demonstrate it right there with, even though people were self-conscious and it was only going on for a couple minutes. Imagine doing something like that for hours. I am just thinking you've just described the average Christian worship service, You're standing exactly. hands to the sky kind of thing. The emotive mm-hmm. music is playing sensory response. Mm-hmm. You feel connected to mm-hmm. your fellow human beings, the joy of music. Dr. Wathi, you yeah. got a computer model for that? <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a computer model for it, but I, you, you've just triggered a, a wonderful memory that I have to re- relate. I went to an atheist conference here in San Diego, I guess maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I can't remember exactly when it was. But Dan Barker was one of the attendees there. He was giving a a talk there. And somewhere near the end of this afternoon-long session of talks and discussion, Dan Barker sat down at the piano in front of a group of atheists and started belting out secular songs about about atheism and humanism and stuff like that and and passed out lyrics and we all sang along and it just brought me right back to my childhood in in the Christian church it was the same emotions mm-hmm. the same group cohesion the everything you've just been discussing with Andy but without the god part <laughs> so that's a real phenomenon that really happens when you get people you know singing and dancing and moving and swaying and all of that together in unison, it definitely does alter the brain chemistry. But if that is effective in the church and the church does it well, the thinking is I can get this high outside the church. I can go somewhere else without having to sell a superstition and I can still get the same high. Sure. Well, (laughs) okay, but, but, but not quite because again, pardon me, but like, uh, it, as John points out in his book, there's all these allusions to the mother who's going to take care of you as a helpless child in the lyrics. Right, and right. So that's in there, too. Like, think about Amazing Grace, you know, who saved a wretch like me. The content of what you're singing is an extra dimension that we don't get when we're singing the songs of our university at a football game. Right, right. You get the bonding, but the content of the hymns also digs deep into this powerful old attachment. Yes, good point. Um, And I think that's an extra dimension that we don't appreciate. So we can have all of the same things in our secular rituals, like, you know, Dan Barker playing the piano and singing these songs, but there's an extra dimension to religion and the, the content of the hymns that we don't have in the secular world. I've been saving this question for a while. Dr. Thompson says that religion is like a hamburger. Like you can reverse engineer religion and you can reverse engineer the hamburger and they have similarities? What? We're going to find out what he's talking about in just a second. Hang on. (music) 
my patrons get the broadcast early and totally commercial free. Thanks for your support. Patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Continuing my conversation about belief and the brain with psychiatrist Dr. Andy Thompson and computational biologist and neuroscientist Dr. John Wathy. Both of their books are linked in the description box. I worry a little bit that I might be backtracking in our conversation, but I had this note to ask you, Dr. Thompson. You once said that the Big Mac, the McDonald's hamburger, the Big Mac explains religion. Mm -hmm. I need more. Like, can you can you walk me through that? Sure. How does the Big Mac explain religion? Well, junk food, pornography, they have the same psychological structure as religion. And you go, what? <laughs> and here's how it works. You and I have ancient cravings for sweets, okay? And that craving was for the sweet of ripe fruit, okay? Because ripe fruit had crucial calories. It had vitamin C, and it was rare. So when we could get our hands on it, we ate it. So we had cravings for sweetness. But the original sweetness is ripe fruit. You and I had cravings for fat, but that was the fat of lean game meat, which was a compact source of calories, and it was a compact source of protein. It was rare. It was crucial. And so we had cravings for it. You and I don't have cravings for broccoli because tubers were plentiful. You know, we could get those, but we had cravings for things that were crucial and rare. So what is a Big Mac meal? A Big Mac meal has sweets but it's Coca-Cola. It's a super normal stimulus, okay? And so it arises from our cravings from sweets, but it comes back at us at a super normal intensity. So if I eat a peach, I get a little bit of a hit of dopamine. If I drink a Coke, big blast of dopamine, okay? If you've got a choice between a peach and a brownie, I don't know about you, but it's going to be the brownie because yeah. it's a super normal stimulus. We have a craving for fat. What is the Big Mac meal? It's a huge fatty hamburger. And also the French fries are soaked in meat juice. So a Big Mac meal arises from these adaptations, these cravings, but then it comes back to us in a super normal form. So what is religion? Religion comes from, at least in part, our attachment mechanisms, our attachment mechanisms to our parents and our kin. But then religion gives me a super normal parent. You know, my parents could not rescue me from all the tragedies of life. But the God of religion is a super normal parent who will rescue me from all the terrors of life. So again, coming from an ancient basic adaptation, arising from that, but then coming back at us as a super normal stimulus. The three of us are men. We have sexual desires, particularly towards physical features of women that indicate youth, fertility, and health. Pornography gives it to us in a super normal stimuli. Okay, so the, the psychology of junk food, the psychology of pornography, same psychology at a fundamental level as religion. And that's also what we create with religious rituals. When we put all those things together in a religious ritual, we're creating a super normal stimulus that utilizes our ancient adaptations, but then you know we get a super normal hit of endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. Dr. Wathi, you want to tag anything on there? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, the phrase super normal actually comes from a, an important field of behavioral biology called ethology, the study of behavior in its natural context. And one of the classic studies of that kind was from the 1950s by uh, Nico Tinbergen, who studied the behavior of herring gull chicks when they first hatch out. They have an innate visual model of their parent's head and bill, and the, the bill of the parent bird has a prominent red spot on the tip. And the chicks will peck at that spot to solicit feeding from the parents which I won't describe in any great detail because it's not exactly a pleasant thing if you're not a bird. But the important point is Tim Bergen discovered that you could get the, the chicks to peck at artificial models of the parent's bill. And if he exaggerated certain attributes like thinness and redness and contrast near the tip, 
he could make a stimulus that was even more effective than the natural one. So the word he probably wanted to use for this was supernatural, more than natural, better than natural. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. supernatural was already taken and had God concepts, religious concepts. So, so he used the word supernormal, more than normal, for an artificial stimulus that worked better than the natural stimulus does at eliciting the behavior. So that's kind of the biological background of that idea. But Andy is right on target. The innate model of a mother that a human infant has, I think, is, is a thing that the innate model is expecting the mother to be wanting to help, able to help, and capable of helping the infant. And God is the exaggeration of that. The Savior God is the exaggeration of that to an extreme degree where God doesn't just know what to do to help you. God knows everything. God is not only capable of helping you and saving you. God is capable of doing anything. He's omnipotent. <laughs> so, you know, so, so we just exaggerate these attributes and make a supernormal stimulus. So God is better at exciting that innate model of the mother, even better than a real mother is. That's the only thing I would add. Before I uh, end on kind of a philosophical note, and you've been generous with your time, anything we've missed any salient point that you'd like the audience to know in regard to your book or the discussions you're having about religions, about the discussions we're having about religions? Anything that you'd like to highlight quickly? Well, I don't know. I would, I would want to um, – I haven't read much of Andy's ideas about narcissism, but I've, I've, I have some of my own that I talked about a little bit in the book. And I have just recently gave a talk about the insurrection of January 6th and Donald Trump and narcissism and so on. I, I would be grateful if, if Andy would have any, anything to say about narcissistic personality disorder and how it may have some relevance to religion. And if I can piggyback onto your question before he begins, does this speak to a priming by religions toward authoritarianism? Um. The most recent thing I've written with Dr. Catherine Basilis is a chapter on arrogance, which is a, you know, part of narcissism. Again, I think it goes to the broader issue of educating everybody. And we know that in populations, because of frequency-dependent selection, there are going to be narcissistic individuals. They are people who can get power, and they can get power politically and religiously, and if we educate ourselves, that's the best armament against it. The only thing I would add, Seth, for your audience to think of and for all of us to think of, which is that we need to press to get these discoveries of the last 20 years into basic textbooks of psychology. That's going to be an uphill climb, considering that uh, Arkansas just passed a bill to allow creationism to be taught as science. Absolutely. But you want to keep in mind, that I think there are 20 cases have been litigated about this, many before the Supreme Court, and science is always one. And Arkansas wants to do it again? Bring it on. I mean, it, it'll go through the courts, and it should ultimately be defeated. Once it gets adjudicated, that kind of stuff gets knocked out. And we shouldn't be afraid of an uphill climb. If we look at a comprehensive psychological science of religious belief, and if we look at that as kind of a Mount Everest, as a mountain that's a hard one to climb, scientifically, politically, socially, it's a hard mountain to climb. But we are much higher up that mountain than we were at the turn of the century. And we want to be proud of that and keep that in mind as we push higher up the mountain, push back politically, push back socially, and push back educationally. Dr. Wathi, are you holding on to a sense of optimism? I do, at least from the statistics that I, I see about belief in God and, and religion in, in the younger generation. There seems to be less of it. There seems to be a more skeptical and better educated generation coming. I hope that trend continues. It's, I think it's a good sign. The only other thing I would say is that, you know, Andy's idea about teaching the psychology of psychological basis of religious feeling and so on in high school textbooks. I think that's a great idea. It's definitely a goal to shoot for. And the only thing I would add to that is that there are intermediate steps that would probably be a little more palatable to school boards and that would get us moving in that direction even before we reach that goal. And that would be to emphasize the teaching of things like 
Daniel Kahneman's ideas in, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the distinction between intuition and cold reason based on, you know, thinking based on reason and evidence. There's a, there are two very different ways of human thinking. And just to get that much <laughs> into psychology textbooks would help a lot. Is that like mm-hmm. uh, Jonathan Haidt's uh, The Elephant and the Rider kind of thing? Yes, very much okay. so. Yes, mm-hmm. the same kind of idea. Mm-hmm. Well, I promised I would end on kind of a philosophical note, so forgive the daytime television question here to wrap up the show. But, gentlemen, how do you find comfort and meaning and purpose, right? You don't hold to a deity, a higher power, a father, a a lawgiver, someone who's got a master plan. So how do you find the good stuff? I'll start with you, Dr. Thompson. I got interested in the psychology of happiness and well-being a couple of years ago and trying to incorporate that into my clinical practice and my life. And I think a useful way of summarizing it is a triple A battery, three A's, agency, attachment, altruism. And if you want well-being in your life, you want to have, as much as you can, areas of your life that are under your control. You're not dancing to other people's tunes all the time. There are things that you're doing that are your choice, your pleasure, your agency, and that that's crucial. Agency. Attachments. Attachments, good, close social relationships. Good families, good friends, good colleagues, you know, working to build your attachments, making them a priority in your life. And the third is altruism. Feeling down, feeling kind of bad, go help somebody. And I think if you keep those things in mind, just try to remember a AAA battery whenever you're down and you can take that AAA battery and do an assessment of where you are in your own life and usually find some places to correct along those three dimensions. And that's how I do it. Dr. John Wathy, what's your model? for comfort, meaning, and purpose in your own life? Oh, it's very hard for me to outdo what Andy just said. I I identify very strongly with what he just said. I guess I could only add that for me, a very special particular thing that helps me a lot in, in hard times is being out in nature. I love feeling the, connected to nature, to being out in the wilderness. I think there may be something primal there that we humans have a, a love of, of the wilderness and, and nature and For me, that helps a lot. Dr. John Wathy and Dr. Andy Thompson, you two are always amazing communicators. And I think you add some critical insights to these discussions about belief and the brain and, and, you know, the real world. I think the beauty and the magic of the real world, which is something I discovered when I finally left, you know, I didn't realize how small my world really was until I got out and Mm -hmm. took a look around. Is that a common thing? You know, you see people who were like, well, I thought I had everything I needed. And now on the other side of the looking glass, I'm like, holy shit. (laughs) You probably see a lot of that, right? Yes, absolutely. I agree. Seth, thank you for having us. And Thank you for inviting me, but particularly I want to thank you for inviting me with uh, John because he's one of my new heroes, and I just hope people will dive into the feast that is his work, and I'm really looking forward to the second volume. Yeah, you guys should hit the road. Like I'd I'd buy tickets to that tour. That'd be really good. I'm going to put uh, links to your books in the description box with my strong encouragement to the audience. Go deeper. Take the plunge. Get the info. You Mm -hmm. will find your, your whole perception on this issue broaden. Thank you both so much, Dr. John Wathy, Dr. Andy Thompson. Let's talk again soon, okay? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Seth. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.